Today I want to talk about the pain medications. Next few weeks I would like to talk about pain medications because pain is universal. As you live in this world, you will encounter pain in some form or the other, a joint pain or a headache or some kind of belly pain or any organ in our body can cause pain. So it's important to know the basic medications about pain. I would like to start with acetaminophen, commonly known as paracetamol or acetaminophen. And it is the most commonly administered over-the-counter oral analgesic in the world. But you see, the mystery is, even though it is the most commonly used analgesic in the entire world, the analgesic mechanism of acetaminophen still is uncertain. We have non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, let me say NSAIDs, NZs, for the sake of brevity. So in contrast to NZs, acetaminophen or paracetamol is not anti-inflammatory. Acetaminophen is commonly combined with opioid medications to reduce the amount of opioid needed. But such combination products may be difficult to titrate. So we have hydrocodone with Tylenol, we have oxycodone with Tylenol, we have these combinations. But you remember, if you do not watch how much you are taking them, you might end up with Tylenol overdosing. That's why recently the amount of Tylenol is set at 325 milligrams. So even if you take 10 Vicodin tablets, you are still getting less than 3.5 grams of Tylenol. So Estaminophen overdose, you, also, you should always remember that because people can overdose with estaminophen and can have severe hepatotoxicity. You see, what is the most common cause of acute liver failure in the world? It is coming from acetaminophen or paracetamol. So this concern with hepatotoxicity is important to remember, especially people who drink alcohol, people who have liver disease, they should be careful with how much Tylenol they are taking a day. And they should remember the dose, how much they are taking. If you do a blood test, you will see their hepatic amino transfer is concentration going up. But just because their liver enzymes go up, that doesn't mean they are going into acute liver failure. So a constant watch is needed when they are taking estaminophen for long terms. Now, what is the maximum safe dose? The safety of long term estaminophen is set at 4 grams per day. But many people are questioning that. The FDA lists the maximum dose of estaminophen to be like 4 grams per day. But many manufacturers are reducing that to, two, to 3 to 3.5 grams. So I would personally say stay under 3 grams. Significant liver disease or heavy alcohol dose also should be considered. If the patient has liver disease, then you need to be more uh, careful with how much estaminophen they are taking. There are other adverse effects like uh, uh, chronic kidney disease, hypertension, and peptic ulcer disease. So now let me talk about non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, NSAIDs. They are indicated for mild pain, moderate pain particularly somatic origin. And uh, there are many different combinations. They are commonly used for soft tissue injuries like after uh, sports injuries, strains, sprains, headaches, arthritis. 
I take ibuprofen almost every week whenever I have, I have a headache or joint pain or back pain. So these NSAIDs, they can be used with opioids to exert synergy. And the analgesic effect of NSAIDs that derives from the peripheral action on the enzyme cyclooxygenase. So cyclooxygenase, it plays a central role in inflammatory conditions. And it's as well as on the central nervous system and on the pain states. So you use NSAIDs to block these enzymes that cause pain and they were definitely more effective than placebos. So NZs, even though they are a blessing to combat pain, unfortunately they come with a lot of side effects. We need to remember the side effects very carefully because some of them are very, very serious. So if possible, use as little as possible or even a topical NZ like diclofenac. Use diclofenac cream just for that area. So some of these are selective. They are called viral cyclooxygenase 2 inhibitors, COX-2 inhibitors. So some of them are selective, some of them are non-selective. So when you use them, for example, let us say celecoxib for patients with chronic NZ treatment who are at risk for gastropathy, celecoxib is a good medication. So let me talk about the side effects of these medications. Now there are many NZs and you can always change one from the other. If a patient says I cannot tolerate this, you can change it to a different medication. And you can improve the compliance by uh, switching from one medication to the other medication or by changing the frequency like try to make it once a day it's easier to take once a day than three times a day and the main adverse effects of NZs they inhibit platelets in other words they promote bleeding they can also gastrointestinal injury they can cause heart problems that's important to remember so if a patient comes with heart disease, you need to be careful. So the regular NZ use should be avoided. And if a patient is taking low dose aspirin for cardiovascular protection, you need to be more careful because most NZs interfere with platelet aggregation. But there are some exceptions like choline magnesium trisalicylate and selective COX-2 inhibitors. Despite its short half-life, aspirin irreversibly inhibits platelet aggregation for the lifetime of the platelet. The inhibitory effect of other NZs lasts about two days. NZs produce adverse gastrointestinal side effects like dyspepsia, gastric ulceration. Patients who are deemed at high risk for peptic ulcer or its complications. So if a patient says, I have peptic ulcer, you need to be careful because these NZs, whether it is a meloxicam or naproxen or ibuprofen, it can cause bleeding in these patients. And if, they, if you are using with prednisone, the risk only increases. So give with food or antacids to decrease the dyspepsia that come from these medications. So some doctors actually prescribe proton pump inhibitors. I went to a clinic and I was uh, told by the nurse that the doctor, every time he gives in NZ, he always prescribes a proton pump inhibitor. And I thought that's a good practice. Nephrotoxicity is another problem. And nephrotoxicity can cause reversible renal insufficiency due to renal vasoconstriction, acute interstitial nephritis, and also a predisposition to acute tubular necrosis in patients with low renal perfusion. So NZs can lead to fluid retention and they can cause hypertension. 
So you see all these side effects coming from these uh, NZs in patients with cardiovascular disease. NZs interfere with cardioprotective effect of aspirin and they potentially exacerbate heart failure. They raise blood pressure. NZs, they also can cause prothrombotic effects. That's why it's a relative contraindication in patients with uh, blood clots. So if a patient is having high risk for blood clots, be careful in prescribing NZs. So use as little as possible and as short as possible. Those are the two important things to remember. Use as, like for example, we all get pain. So I got pain, what should I do? So use as little as possible for as short time as possible. Those are the key uh, truths when we use any medication, especially Tylenol and NSAIDs. And those are the points I wanted to share with you. In the coming weeks, I will be talking about more pain medications and feel free to follow up in our blog. Thank you so much.